Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Yonit Arthur. I'm an audiologist and coach. You are on The Steady Coach, and it is my great privilege today to bring you this wonderful success story from Sam. Sam is the survivor of what I would say is one of the most extreme, intense, and difficult cases of neural circuit dizziness that I have ever seen. And it's taken Sam about two years to recover from her symptoms. I know all of the success stories on my channel look a little different, but this one is really going out to those of you with so much love from me that have extreme symptoms and or are taking time to recover. In this interview, Sam goes into her story and goes into a lot of detail on how she recovered, but we didn't go into as much detail on the symptoms she had. So I'm going to tell you now just a brief list of her worst symptoms. So Sam's most extreme symptoms had to do with her vision. She had visual vertigo. She had blurry vision. She had delays in her vision. She had extreme light sensitivity. She had a lot of sensitivity to visual patterns, to large spaces and small spaces. She also had terrible neck and shoulder pain, and she had headaches as well as pain in her eyes and pressure in her head and her eyes. She had terrible brain zaps and, of course, a lot of anxiety, difficulties relaxing and sleeping, and many of the other symptoms that many of you deal with, as well as general dizziness. So if that doesn't give you some kind of clue as to what condition Sam was in when I first met her in 2021, I think you're going to hear a little bit more of that from her and get a better sense of that from her story. There's a lot of wisdom in this. And I think Sam gives some really interesting and valuable advice. So I think you're going to learn a lot from this interview as well. I'd love to hear your comments and questions, so please drop them below if you're watching this on YouTube. You can also like, you can share the video, you can subscribe to my channel, or if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can follow the podcast, or if you like the podcast, leave me a five-star review. All of these things help me reach more people. Please enjoy this conversation with the incredible Sam. Welcome, Sam. It's so exciting to have you here for this. Hello, Yonit. Hello. Hello. This has been a long time coming. You don't know this, but I, I talk about you all the time as a message of, uh, you're like a beacon of hope to people without even <laughs> knowing it. So I figured we may as well make that official with, yes. with an interview. If she can stop being dizzy, so can you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So before we dive into your story, would you mind just telling us a little bit about you? A little bit about me generally. Well, I'm 55. I live in London. Um, gosh, what else to say? Uh, yes, I've had a history of difficult things, but also lots of wonderful things. Worked in mental health for many years, taught arts therapy in um, prison for 25 years and secure psychiatric hospital and blah, 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 blah. Make my own art, um, have a very full social life, etc. Sell vintage clothes, have a dog, have a husband, probably in that order of preference. <laughs> and, uh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> oh, and and you are also a meditation teacher. Oh, yes. And I teach Zen as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, that, that's been a recent development since your recovery, actually, it as well. Has. Yes. I mm -hmm. don't, th despite having been training sort of pretty much all the time, it's the one thing I carried on doing. Mm -hmm. The one thing I actually managed to do was to, even when I couldn't get out of the house, I'd listen to my teacher online. I'd sort of uh, plug into that. Um, yes, that was always there and a massive part of it and segues beautifully actually into everything yes. we're going to talk about as well. It is totally complementary and parallel um, in terms of neutral observation. But uh, yes, yeah, so now I do that as well. Yes. Okay, I, I cannot Oh, wait. and I should say as yes. well, I've, I've completely forgot as well, I also coach people to recover from chronic pain and mostly chronic fatigue syndrome. So, That's yes. right. So so really, the, the 
I guess the preface to this entire story of dizziness is that you also previously had recovered from chronic fatigue syndrome. Very, very severe chronic fatigue syndrome, which is why when I had the, the dreaded dizziness, it was very, very severe. Because yes. as you know, the severity of one presentation in the system will normally be matched wherever you go by severity. So yes. 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 So I, I mean, I'm, I'm very curious to hear after we, we pivot into your story, I'm very curious to hear now retrospectively why some of the things that you did for the chronic fatigue syndrome needed a little more sprucing up to help you resolve the dizziness and the other related symptoms. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you want me to say that now? Let's let's go into the dizziness first and we'll okay, come back fine. to this. Yes, I'm just, making just a mental note to myself. And I'll do my best. Yes. Okay. Okay. So why don't you tell us the story of how it started? Do you want maybe maybe starting um, from the surgery or Right. Well, I had recovered from the chronic fatigue. Okay. And like I say, it was very severe and it was basically a process of um neural retraining in combination with other sort of psychological discovery and processing of, of, of emotions and trauma and blah, 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 blah. Um, that was in 2019 and it was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Um, I don't think I'd covered, recovered completely because these things are never a sort of done deal in, in an obvious linear way, but I was back to living in a pretty, you know, in a way I hadn't done for years. So that was really great. And then at the beginning of lockdown, um, I previously had had massive back surgery when I was younger and I had metal um, rods in my back and various bits and bobs, which was really quite significant. A friend of mine, I'm going to keep this short because it is quite complicated, decided to give me a massage. She was training to do Thai massage and um, she massaged this point at which well, there was a lot of metal underneath, I was like, oh, you know, um, no problem. And just at the, just at the beginning of lockdown, this was, it swelled up and it's like, oh, that feels a bit odd. I showed my husband, it's like, no, no, don't worry about it. And then after a while, this hole appeared in my back and stuff started coming out of it. And they put me on lots of antibiotics and this, that and the other, and it transpired. I had a big bacterial infection in all of the metal work in my back, which of course, uh, antibiotics can only work on living things, not on metal. So from what seemed like might be quite a small thing, I had to have which was described uh, by the anaesthetist going in possibly the biggest surgery it is possible for a human to have during lockdown. So my husband wasn't there. I had to sort of walk into a hospital on my own, be there for a month, six and a half hours surgery of chipping out all this metal, um, which is said when they opened my back, it was just full of pus and they couldn't even believe I was still standing, um, but survived that long story short on my own, couldn't even have, visitors um very very difficult but surprisingly past okay i can't don't know how it actually is something i did manage because of my understanding of 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 neuroplasticity and meditation and various things i did manage to do do that the worst thing was the food but the one thing my husband was allowed to bring me vegan food every day he dropped it at the door <laughs> with the dog and ran so that made a big difference um but that's another story that did help enormously but so um Recovered from that very well. That's all good, done and dusted. Um, it was pretty massive and it was a huge recovery. You know, I was on intravenous antibiotics for four months after that. I had a midwife coming around all masked up, having to, had a pick line and stuff. So a lot of physical stuff going on. Oh. Anyway, so felt better from that. And I, you know, it was okay for a couple of months. And then suddenly I started having all these visual, visual problems, sort of disturbances, sort of tracking problems, having to blink a lot. I do a lot of sewing. A lot of my work is textiles and um, it's a lot of close work, a lot of drawing. Um, and it just felt, started feeling off in that way that people will relate to. And then started feeling very off. And I think it was a gradual thing. I then at this point, I started doing breath work as well. I'd been doing breath work for a while and I'd been to have my eyes tested and my optician went oh my god uh when he did that looking at the back of your eye thing you've got a, a retinal vein hemorrhage oh my god on top of this so 
big hoo-ha because that can make you go blind very quickly and is considered a, an ocular emergency. So this is a, an aside really, but for a while, the reason I'm telling you this is, I mean, I was at Moorfields Hospital, which is a big eye hospital here. They believed that my visual disturbance, well, I did have a visual disturbance. Um, it knocked out part of the um, vision top left of my eye. I think it's actually, yeah, so I had this first, sorry, I had the eye bleed first and then the stuff happened. Actually, no, I think I started having a bit of visually stuff. And then, um, it's so hard to remember it, but it never got better and then it got really worse and I couldn't focus really on anything properly and started just feeling so, it's hard to remember now because it's, you know, everybody listening to this will be wanting me to mirror perfectly their experience. I, I, I'm sure I can just say, without even knowing you, whatever you're experiencing, I had with bells on, it was unbelievable. I couldn't even move my eyes in my head with my eyes closed without feeling sick and dizzy. Um, I literally, if I even just moved my head, if I was lying in bed, it was incredible. And so of course my whole nervous system was ramped up to this point, like I was about to be murdered constantly, which then increased, you know, my perception of what was going in my head and my eyes no one understood at this point we thought it was something as everybody has initially uh you know biologically wrong so having in the midst of this to be tested going to see neurologists this was after go, the retinal bleed had been yes, addressed yes, yes. so it was well, addressed this, this yes exactly they did they'd address it they said you know you should you, you have an acute situation but it's recovered, praise be, there's no lasting damage, but it's like, well, what the hell is wrong here? So then they're doing all the things like saying, you've got dry eye syndrome, we're returning, we, you know, we're sending you off to a neurologist. Meanwhile, my GP, who was just absolutely bloody useless, useless um, was saying, um, was trying to put me on beta blockers, which was one of the worst experiences of my life. And there was a, a projection that in some way I was being a bit neurotic. Uh, I think everyone will be familiar with that, you know. Um, yes. Being that I'm female, clearly I'm neurotic and um, incapable of expressing myself clearly on these things. Even though he's been very good in so many other ways, I think it because it was beyond the bounds of him to understand what it was, it's easier, of course, to blame it on some sort of failure of us to deal with it. So some, it's just anxiety. Blocks, it's yeah, just, then we're going to put me on. Exactly, they're going to put me on, and I had was having these terrible migraines, and they were going to put me on some absolutely vile migraine stuff. And I said, no, no, that's not it. And then the doctor sort of was getting quite annoyed with me because I wouldn't do that. It's like, I'm not personally rejecting you. It's nothing about you, actually. Um, it's, about, just don't, it's, yeah. it's not going to work. That's not it. What's the root here? And so... I started wearing an eye patch because I realized that if I had one eye covered, it did seem to reduce some of the discomfort and take my glasses off and trying to relax my eyes. I had hot pads on my eyes, all of these things because the, the eye strain, the stinging, all of that was, was appalling. And just um, so we're clear, again, I'm reiterating this for mm. anyone who, who didn't follow. This was after the retinal bleed had been addressed. At, At this point, there was nothing physically secure. wrong. Nothing. nothing was wrong. And yet things got worse and worse. And worse Sam, and worse. I knew you. I knew you at this point. So I can I can recall some of the sensations and yeah. symptoms you had. So I remember when I first met you, you did not move your head at all. <laughs> like right now, you just moved your head to demonstrate. Yes. You're, you, you sat like this. You kind of... When you moved, like your whole body would spin with you. You were you were so afraid to move your head. Um, you couldn't go into your sewing room or the oh, fridge. I couldn't go into the studio. I couldn't go. In, I couldn't go into the bathroom because right. the bathroom had the tiles on the wall. And of course, I had to go for a wee, and it literally was stealing yourself to do it. I mean, I was in a state of absolute terror the whole time. So, looking at the tiles, I'd have to try and shut my eyes to go in the bathroom. I'd have this visceral, existential terror. You know couldn't go into my studio I mean couldn't go anywhere couldn't look in the fridge was like hell I remember, of course, I, remember. I, was, I was thinking everything I knew about sort of classical conditioning and exposure and I was thinking I'm just going to look I'm just going to open the fridge and look at it and it was like I was in some sort of horror film so it was appalling and um particularly anything where I had to look up that exacerbated it completely and meanwhile I tried to change my glasses 
Um, every time you sort of change your glasses or do anything, it was horrible. I spent a fortune on these new glasses, which did bugger all. Um, you know, because you're just searching around, there was no one really to hold me and support me. And I think it's the fact, because of course it's so nervous system related, you're feeling so scared anyway, you just want someone to go, there, there, you've got this, 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 relax, this is all you do. But there is no one to do that. So in the midst of feeling absolutely terrified in a state, you're having to try and Google with a pirate eye, work out what you've got and try and action something. So I first worked out, I was, I was looking at things, I thought, right, I've got triple PD, or this is a functional neurological disorder. That's what I worked out. I thought I'm a, because of course it fitted in with the profile of the chronic fatigue syndrome. I was like, yes, this is, this is beginning to make sense. How so long did it you to get to that point though? Like how long did you have to suffer before you said, oh about oh, five this, months and that was yeah. only the beginning then and that was only um a hunch really so i was trying to do that there wasn't really much that i could find so i was looking at stuff mm -hmm. um you know emailed my doctor and said, i think this is what it is i think this is what it is he was like mm -hmm. he hadn't really heard of it so therefore of course it didn't exist right <laughs> right of course outside the remit of his knowledge so therefore it can't exist I was just, you know, so that was really a difficult thing, having to deal with these other people's egos at the same time. Same really with my husband, um, who is a doctor as well. So he kind of um, feels that anything new or challenging or a bit esoteric or somehow mind-body is a personal threat in some way because it's not yeah. something that they're au fait with in that way and it might challenge the way they, they practice their things. So um it was a very lonely experience but i was sure that was what it was and so i was looking for lots of dizziness things and what have you and first of all i found that other woman who wasn't very helpful um i don't know if she's still going actually you have to tell me that later um but which and so i read a lot of that and it seemed terribly complicated and very sort of basic psychology with a bit of woo thrown in and i thought mm, this is not particularly helpful and i don't have the capacity to do it because even my thoughts at this point were triggering me because my nervous system was so overwhelmed it didn't even want to think so I was having brain fog and all sorts which I'd never experienced during CFS which is a primary CFS yes um mm -hmm. uh you know symptom but I'd never actually had that so this was all completely new to me so I was trying to work it all out and then I came across your channel I thought ah right okay so and I think it was quite new then wasn't it you would mm -hmm. it was new Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. so gosh, it was, this would have been in 2021, right? Maybe at the, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't brand new, but it was, yeah, it was early. You didn't on. have, you didn't have that many videos. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't No, but thankfully I had one on visual vertigo. Yes. And That's I think that was the, that was the one yeah. I, um, yes. Because the thing is, it wasn't, it, you know, this is the thing, because like dizziness is a bit of a catch-all. So it wasn't like yes. a lot of people where I stand up and I'm dizzy. It's like the whole thing is dizzy, like your whole inside your head. Every time you move your eyes, it is it's it is vertiginous in that way. Mm -hmm. And you were the closest person I'd come to sort of witness that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I looked at all your videos and thought, right, okay, yes. And then it really mirrored and sort of matched up with a lot of what the chronic fatigue syndrome stuff was but I was in by this time in such a state I couldn't really function in in any way just the the, the you know, I couldn't even there was there was no respite I couldn't even lie down and go to bed there was no peace couldn't watch television couldn't read a book couldn't listen to music any sort of stimulation what just, would happen just, tell, tell us more about that. So you were basically stuck at home, not being able to do anything. Um, yes. So I just had to lie there. Yeah. In in torment. Meanwhile, that greater part of your brain that's outside of this, of your of your sort of higher awareness, is going right. Okay, we've got to work this out, and is trying to objectively understand what's going on. And given the facilities that are available, work some way through. Mm -hmm. but on your own um very 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 tricky and i think so then i met you so i didn't feel so 
alone is I hear someone who at least understands this is what other people have this is psychogenic this is coming from somewhere we can understand it because I if I could understand the anatomy what was going on then I could work out mm -hmm. how to do it but bloody hell you know if only it was yeah possible. yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember very well what the state you were in when I first met you. And I was putting on a very brave face. Trust yes. Me. Well, depended on how you showed up. Um, if you were wearing lipstick, then you were putting, you know, you were maybe feeling a little bit better. You were, you were putting on the brave face, but occasionally you would show up in active wear. Yeah, I and think that's I, when I, I was just feeling marginally less with the with the lipstick as yeah. opposed to apocalyptically <laughs> yeah. in the active wear when yes. fleece when fleece was deployed we were yes in the, exactly we were, in the, we were in mordor yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> we can laugh about it now but i remember um oh, i remember God. i remember the end of the year it was right maybe right after christmas you had one of your lowest points do you remember yes. i certainly do yeah and it just seems, and this is what I want to reassure people about, it literally seems that every door is closed. There is nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're trying to use that thinking part of our brain to solve, to solve, to solve, to fix it, to change it. And of course, now I know, you know, it, it's exactly the same as everything, the way we perceive things. All you have to do is just allow it, sit back, First of all, just really scale back everything. Give yourself permission just to let it run its course all the time, knowing it's okay. Which is easier said than done. Oh, so much easier said than done. You know? Yeah. And because so I had so done. little facility, you know, something I do know from the people I work with, with um, sort of, you know, exposing them to and retraining their brain with mind body, you know, with, with somatic tracking or whatever. Is that normally when you're above a six in terms of um, symptoms, it's much more difficult because your executive function will go offline, your prefrontal cortex will go offline. So, you know, you're always advised to do this when you're a six or below. Well, I was at a 10 all the time. I remember. So that's, and that's when why I so heard important. this, I thought, yeah. oh my God, well, ha there's no hope. There's no I hope. Remember. So mm -hmm. I just had to work so hard and just really, because there was no alternative. So, for everyone out there who feels they're at a 10, you can do it, you can, but you just have to keep reminding yourself you're safe. And it's that thing of that which is dizzy, that which knows I'm dizzy is not itself dizzy. And keep observing yourself from outside, keep understanding that you are not that. And that in itself is a constant somatic tracking outside right. the wonderful videos you do. And every time you do that, you're allowing your brain to stand down just a rung on that. Right, right, right. That so nervous system arousal. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to just say a word here just to kind of clarify again, for those mm. of you who are newer to my work or, or this idea in general. Um, so what Sam is talking about sounds complicated and it's not. So no. Uh, it is it is hard, but it's not complicated. So what Sam is basically saying is when people are feeling awful, they tend to identify as being the symptom, like as being in the symptoms. So they'll say to themselves, I'm just so dizzy. I'm just so vertiginous. I just feel so awful. And by say, rephrasing this, so again, at first, this can be just cognitive. This can just be the way you talk about it at, by just saying something like, I notice that there is a part of me that feels really awful. So uh, it may it may feel very weird to say it that way at first, but I notice there is a part of me that's feeling anxious. I know there's a part of me that's thinking I'm never going to get better. I know there's a part of me feeling really whirly right now. Yes. Light on. Keep, I'm just yes, light yes, on. yes. So when you when you do that that's what that's what sam is referring to that's be that's basically the beginning of somatic tracking where you're taking a step back and you're allowing and observing the sensations or feelings or thoughts so um somatic tracking that exercise i'll put a link to that in the video description but that's the first place to start getting practice doing this and sam is saying that's the first place she had to start also Ma reminding herself that the dizziness wasn't all that she was 
that there was more to her than just that sensation or just the anxiety or just the fear or just the thoughts that were coming with it. I think, you know, it's the same principle I had to use to get better from chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, you're gradually exposing yourself to uh, the symptoms, but in a place of objectivity and safety, which if it's, you know, I had very, very, you know, when people who don't know about chronic fatigue syndrome, you don't feel sleepy or tired. It's like having full on flu, jet lag, a hangover and, you know, everything going on is absolutely vile. But the difference is it wasn't in my head in the way that dizzy, dizziness is so it's a very different thing but so what you're, you'd be doing i'd be but you know you'd be exposing yourself to say activity a walk mm-hmm. um and bear in mind i was so ill when i had chronic fatigue syndrome my first exercise was turning over in bed every 10 minutes you know that constituted activity and this is why my um when i did get the dizziness it, it, when it transferred to that it was so strong so um you know and just when those sensations come up and your nervous system's freaking out, going, ah, what's this? We don't know what it is. Just going, it's fine. Just watch it and reassure yourself. And it took me, and as soon as I sort of realized, ah, it is the same thing. Um, it is the same approach. It's allowing it and uh, objectively observing it and not, you know, not trying to fix, not trying to fix it is a massive thing. And you, you, you know, you talk about that. And that's, that was so big for me with my chronic fatigue syndrome as well. It's is because trying to fix it is, is is attaching to it in some way, and you're making it a focus. Yes, your you're sending your brain the signal. Hey, more of this, please, because yes. it's something I'm worried about. Yes, yeah, and it's a it's about suppression. Yeah. And the fact is, if there's a part of you that can know that things going on, but you can still think about something else and not to- there's always a part of your brain that's in control. And I know that's a hard concept, but there is always is always that because if you can step outside of if you if you know you're dizzy, there's a part of you that's not. There's always an observer. And, and I yep. always remember when I was working in the hospital, people yeah. would be saying, "Oh my God, I'm so frightened. I'm, I'm going mad. I'm going mad. I'm going mad." And I said, "The fact that you think that means you're not, because I've worked with some very very ill people, you know, who are there on the section, who are locked up, it was secure. The people who have truly gone mad." have lost that objectivity, they don't know they've gone mad. And the yeah. fact is every single one of us who is here and listen to this knows that they are experiencing this symptom, the, the sequence of, 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 of sensations. So therefore it's only a thing that your brain is doing. It's mm-hmm. not you. And yes. I just want to reassure you, the fact that you do that means you will never be swallowed by it. As much as it feels like it's going to overpower you, you won't be and you're probably thinking yeah 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 but mine's like this this um, trust me mine Mm -hmm. was so bad it it was absolutely the worst you could imagine and I have you know had to work my ass off to do it but it's Mm -hmm. simply the working is not thinking it's not having to do anything you know to fix it it's just to allow it to be it's just sitting in the room with me doesn't feel pleasant you know to put it mildly but eventually it will change. And um, please, please, please believe me on that. Right, right. And accepting it in this way, it is what it is right now, right now is only talking about right now, moment to moment. Yes, it's not course. saying I'm surrendering to this and I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life. That's That's not at all what we're talking about. Although, of course, you're going to have thoughts like that right now because you're not feeling well. But what we're talking about is every moment working on letting it be there even just for the moment and not jumping ahead of yourself and trying to figure out what that might mean for tomorrow. What you feel right now does not mean anything about what you're going to feel later today or tomorrow. And the outcome independence thing, exactly. Because Mm -hmm. even if you just catch it and, you know, have that moment of objectivity, you've just, you you know, you've created, you've gone away from that old neural circuit, that Mm -hmm. dysfunctional maladaptive one. And of course, you're not that's not going to be the dominant circuit now so you'll still have those sensations but what's going on under the hood is still working and then one day you'll have a glimpse or you'll have a lessening which shows the neural new new neural pathway is taking place so this is the thing you've got to hold your nerve because you're being asked in a way to believe in fairies but hey fairies are real in that case (laughs) you know i mean these these fairies are at least anyway right Um, the neural circuit dizziness fairies are are real very real you have to um really really suspend 
your need to believe in the moment materially, which is very difficult when you're feeling in fight or flight because you want everything to be explained and mm -hmm. be tangible, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I think it was St. Augustine, you know, we, we believe so that we can understand. Mm -hmm. We will create something because we need to know the map at least. Um, so you just have to suspend your disbelief, know that there are people who've gone down the path before and it's okay. Yes. That's all. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if you can say a word about what it was like doing some of this, well, getting back out and about um, before you were really feeling better. Because I think another misconception mm. people have sometimes is that they need to wait until they feel better and then go do things. No, it's a bit like the idea with chronic fatigue. So you need to rest and then you'll feel better. It won't happen. You have to take control completely. So you are going to go outside and it's going to feel horrible, but it's just a sensation. It's just a sensation and you don't, don't do it for, you don't have to do it for long. If you just do it for a minute at a time or uh, to, you build it up slowly, your brain will suddenly go, oh, okay, you know, build a baseline mm -hmm. and it, and it will change. Um, so it's completely normal for it to be completely unpleasant. However, it's completely unpleasant anyway. So you might as well be experiencing that increasing of capacity to tolerate these sensations more and more and get things done. So, I mean, I couldn't go into a shop for about a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, bearing in mind, yeah. I worked in a high security prison and have had hideous, I mean, I've had a lot of hideous things happen to me. Going into the shop was more frightening. Mm -hmm. because of where my brain had attributed this false sense of danger. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't because, and I'd blur over, uh, you know, it, it would be, and, and, and then I realised latterly, when I would get the, the blurry vision, the fact that I have to do that, that was a sign that something psycho-emotional was happening and all I would have to do is either have a little rest, have a cup of tea, say no to something, realize what was going on in my life. Because the problem is, as much as on some level we, we, we sign up to this, we will, and we've had this conversation before, you know, then you will get a twinge somewhere and you think, ah, no, that is real. There is something I need to do. No, it's always the same thing, which is um, one of your boundaries has been breached in some way. Um, and there's that sort of spontaneous recovery of an old behavior that your brain will think, oh, we'll just go back to that, but it won't last for long. Um, you know, if if you want me to do, sort of expand on the, the TMS thing, the perfect example of that was when I started getting better from all this stuff and it will start moving around um, absolutely ridiculously. Uh, I would then, one day I had this, I, when it started going from the dizziness, I had it in, in my knee and it's like, yeah, yeah, I know what this is. And I was limping around for weeks and I was saying, shut up knee, it's the same thing, it's just all my baggage and stuff from my that hadn't been processed from the things that happened and I woke up one day and there was no pain in my knee and I thought, ha ha that's fine next day woke up the same pain in the opposite knee which you know is well doc documented that bilateral transference but in a way don't everyone out there freak out and think oh when I've lost my dizziness I'm gonna do this it, it doesn't matter you might have it transferred to something for a short a short period it's the same thing and you won't have it as badly as I did because I was a very, 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 very extreme case. But it does go to prove your brain, if you still haven't solved where the fire is, it's just going to keep telling you more and more smoke and you're going to think it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that. That's a it will great keep metaphor. trying to get your attention. It's like, forget yeah. about the smoke, where's the fire? And the fire is probably something that happened years and years and years ago and your poor old brain is going, well, well, what is it? What is it? And it's looking at this very limited menu of things that are not really that frightening. So it's like, oh, so it must be the fridge. It must be um, something absolutely ridiculous. It must be looking at whatever or some innocuous thing, or it will go back to an old injury or it will, you know, it's really just trying its best to keep you safe. And I think once you realize that and you really identify, you don't have to, and this is something you and I have agreed on, you don't have to go back and relive trauma, you just have to know that that is something from the past and literally all you have to do is experience the sensation and the feeling around it. That's all your body wants you to do, your brain wants you to do, 
and it will go. No and and, and relate to it differently. So uh, yes. this is, I think this Without is- Without fear. You and I have not spoken about this, so I, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball. But how do you reconcile this idea that your job is to create this sense of safety and security in your nervous system with needing to go and expose yourself to things that feel like you're being chased by a murderer with a knife. How do you how do you well, reconcile this? That? This this is the, this is the art, and this is why you sometimes get it wrong because it is it is an art, and you're working it out. So it's about having just this is what I had to do with ME, mm -hmm. um, with the CFS. You have to go out of your window of tolerance, the out of the comfort zone, to so push the envelope, but not so much you overwhelm yourself. So. If you did, you then have what would be called a crash, a setback, whatever you want to call it, a flare, mm -hmm. as people call it. It never is because it's it's always a spiral staircase. You're always you're always going up. Um, so, however much you have a flare, if you if you relate to it in a way that isn't with fear, you actually are accelerating. Yes, um, your 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 learning for your brain because it's going. Oh, okay. Even this feeling is is actually not dangerous. But that's it. You Let me highlight that. I'm going to pause yeah. you. I'm going to highlight that. So what Sam just said was that if you do end up having, uh, we've called them dips, uh, dips but a flare, yeah. a dip, yeah. uh, whatever we want to call it, that is the greatest time of opportunity because if yes. you relate to it differently at that point, you're sending yeah. a massive message to your brain that this is okay, that it's safe. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like it's like fast track learning because it's going, well, if that bit wasn't, well, if these this, 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 this extreme sensation isn't even a, a concern well hey you know and it really will just up your baseline and in increase your capacity to that but mm -hmm. it's that period those periods of, of adjustment are periods of learning and if you think about it you're just i always like to think of it as either a health scare or or a thing you're going up the stairs but each time you're coming back to the same points you'll still have the same feelings but what you don't realize you're actually a level above so you'll think because you've got this horrible sensation still you haven't progressed at all in fact no 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 the last thing to go are the sensations but what you're not noticing because your brain is your memory is state dependent is you've actually just managed to walk the dog or go out for an hour or go to the shops or make a cup of tea which you wouldn't have been able to do before it will always be the last thing to go because your brain is so clever it's not going to stop sending you those things till it truly knows you've listened and it doesn't have to bother so, so how did you listen? How did you let your brain know that you were listening when you had to go into a shop initially when things were really awful and really scary? Well, the first thing I do that, that, um, I think you did a video of the, uh, the sort of imaginal exposure type thing, which is yes, graded, but, like, uh, uh yeah. yes, so not graded exposure. I called it, um, guided, what did you call it? guided exposure and graded motor imagery there are two yes, of them graded yeah. motor imagery. so yeah. you would sit and you'd imagine it and so you'd literally um it's, you know kind of very nlp in that respect you'd imagine mm -hmm. you'd actually already done it so your brain wasn't going to be so freaked out so you think hey you'd say hey we're mm -hmm. going to go to the shop you'd imagine it you'd you know like you say imagine someone else doing it first imagine the shop Mm -hmm. imagine yourself in it how you're going to do how you're going to do that what you're going to feel like afterwards and you're sitting back on the sofa with a cup of tea um and that you're still okay mm -hmm. and then you just go and do it as a sort of clinical strike fully aware that you're probably going to have a lot of sensations but look at it as if you're going into training because you are but at the same time you're getting something that you want whatever that thing is from the shop and then coming back and then just being really calm do some parasympathetic breathing. I'm a big fan of that. Anything that engages, um, you know, creates a vagal break, you know, long exhales out, pressing down your pelvis, all of those things just to give some afferent, um, you know, signals of, of, of safety from there, but just experiencing it, not commenting on it. Mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. experiencing those sensations and not having to fix it, which is the skill, which is why I think the somatic tracking is so good because it's so important yeah it is, it is building that neutrality it's a bit it's building that observer third third party witness which is essential actually for all of us on ev on every level but particularly from recovering from this and i would like to say as well everybody thinks oh why me this is so terrible blah 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 everything your experiences has been created by you for you 
Um, it might not seem like that, but you are, it, you have created this on some level as a protection um, to manage something that was probably even more threatening to your psyche at the time. And when you can start looking at it in that way and asking what is it, the purpose of it, um, and it's often really very simple. It's something very, very, very simple. And you know, you know, through parts work, obviously, which is your thing as well, um, that will come to the fore quite quickly. Mm -hmm. But often you don't need that. It just often just means doing less, saying, you know, saying Say no, saying no, mm -hmm. <laughs> when you when you know, rather than saying yes, when you don't do it, just not having to be perfect, not having to do all of these things, not having to go, 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 be involved in mindless activity. And that's really, really important because I think the danger for a lot of people is they think, oh, I've just got to get rid, rid of this thing to get back to my old life. Your old life was rubbish in as much as that you were trying to be her or someone that was trying to survive in a, a difficult environment that meant you were being inauthentic. And um, actually, the majority of people are like this in some way. It's just that for us, people it has manifested in this this vestibular stuff this dizzy stuff mm -hmm. for other people um you know it, it it might be addiction it might be it might be you know, process addiction uh it might be bad backs it might be whatever it might be um anger any any sort of maladaptation Depression, they're not anxiety yeah you know self-regulated mm -hmm. um so if we don't accept that this is a message and we need to change and it's a limiter trying to help us in fact um then we can just risk when we get better going oh finally going back to the old right pushing achieving ways because my guess is and i'm sure you concur on this the majority of people who get these conditions one have a predisposition to some anxiety because of some sort of trauma have a high ace score those who know what that is and have developed people pleasing te uh, tendencies, um, you know, are over empathetic, are over involved in other people, etc. as a way of staying safe. And the fact is, those behaviours are no longer needed. That's so that's, that's the, un I want to underline that. Because so when we say things like your nervous system is creating this, mm. we're not saying that you're at fault or to blame in no. any way, shape or form. The, the The fact that your nervous system is extra sensitive is a, a beautiful adaptation. It, it shows just how resilient and wise your nervous system is. When you go through some of these experiences that Sam was yes. talking about, you, your, your, your nervous system adapts to those situations by becoming extra sensitive, by developing yeah. some of these protective mechanisms. It's not your fault. Actually, it probably all of these things probably kept you alive uh, at, at, at several points during your life. So the problem is that it becomes maladaptive in other situations. So when you're in a new situation where some of those things are no longer needed to keep you alive, the, 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 the cons start to outweigh the pros because it, a lot of these adaptations, unfortunately, also involve you being under a lot more stress, putting a lot more pressure on yourself. And in the long run, that 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 leads to this 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 crisis in many cases. So, for those of you who who had a medical event set things off, I mean, Sam is right there with you. She she did too, but the there's a reason why some people's nervous systems respond to those events by just progressively getting better. Mm -hmm. And some people's nervous system respond to those events by crashing. And mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is differentiate for you so that you can use this information to, to say, well, why did my nervous system crash when that yes. happened to me? Because this is the thing. Your nervous system is working flawlessly. Yes. That's what you yes. have to understand. And it yes. seems... No, it can't be. It's attack. No, no, no. Your fight, your fight. It's not against you. It's absolutely with you. But it did that because there was a greater threat, threat somewhere else. And it might have been when you were a child. It might have been that you had to sacrifice the authenticity of telling someone to go away, shut up, to let you be who you are. 
in exchange for the social connection because you were a child and you couldn't get food or you couldn't be safe or whatever. And of course, that then becomes a habit in the same way that people please. You know, people pleasing is a classic. People pleasing has nothing to do with pleasing people. It has to manage. <laughs> has to do with managing our anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I know this from having a growing up in a with a violent father. Um, I had to be hyper aware of everyone's mood and needs etc because then I could preempt what was happening which is great in the short term but in the long term that's like I'm in, in sort of you know hiding in the jungle from the Viet Cong in 1972 or something it's not really a sustainable model um, right. when exactly. actually you're at home sitting on the sofa with a cup of tea so that is the maladaptation mal mal you're talking about yes um, but I think you have to go back at some point and put out the fire and putting out the fire is just letting your brain know you've seen it mm -hmm. by yes. somatic tracking or when it comes up, just allowing it to be. And so I know I'm talking a lot, but I did want to, you know, one of the really key things for me was this uh, misnomer about listening to our bodies. And I have heard this. Thank you for addressing this. Yes. From Yes. the people, the CFS community and people that listen to their bodies, what they mean is commenting, given the faulty knowledge they have um, on what actually listening is. So a sensation comes up. So the sensation might be dizziness or tiredness or anxiety, whatever. Mm -hmm. Listening to your body means like you're somatically tracking. It's literally neutrally experiencing it. That's it. It's not going, ah, I, I feel tired. I feel dizzy. I need to do something. I need to rest. I need to do that. You stop listening to your body. It literally is an intuitive, neutral, experiential thing. And I think people get this so, so, so wrong. And I wasted years listening to my body by, in fact, rewarding symptoms with something that actually made my world smaller, certainly with the chronic fatigue. So you feel tired. It must be because I've done too much absolutely not it wasn't because I'd done too much it's just that my hypervigilant brain was desperately looking for a source of supposed danger which had come from various things years before and was going uh, well, maybe it's that you know and I bought it and so kept rewarding it until it became an automatic loop and this mm -hmm. is why for the dizzy folk um anything that breaches your sense of self or your 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 psychic self your you know your 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 true center in some way um will that you'll be sent symptoms and that's the way it's telling you and if you can just experience that in safety and go no it's fine it's fine nothing to see you know and by just experiencing it and you know you in that really i i love your somatic tracking particularly the second one it's really it's really really good but every time you go from you know, wherever it is in your body into, and this is the same for meditation, of course, it's the same thing. Any, any kind of commenting, you've lost, you've lost that connection with the listening. And you have to bring yourself back again and again and again. And it's that way your brain will know you've heard. If it doesn't think you've heard, it will keep reissuing the message over and over and over again, louder and louder and louder. And None of this has come out of the blue. And I'm sure a lot of people who you work with have said, oh, it just suddenly happened one day, mm -hmm. like people with chronic fatigue, suddenly one day I was knackered. It's like, no, 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 no. That was the one drop <laughs> in the top of your stress bucket. You use yes. the stress bucket thing. Yes. Um, that sent it off. So people are then focusing on this last drop that went in the bucket rather than the entire contents of the bucket. Um, and they can spend a long time focusing on the last event rather than realizing this bucket's been filling up for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what you were saying, so I, I, I want to, I want to clarify this. There is a, there's a new, you, you, you describe this as observing your own sensations with neutrality. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to reframe that and say that by observing your sensations with neutrality and allowing them, you're actually showing yourself self-compassion. You're actually creating yes. safety by doing yes. that. So it's not like I have to be a wooden neutral observer and I don't no, care no, about no. any of this. Exactly. It's it's showing love. It's, uh, you know, the, the metaphor I've given recently, if you have a scared shelter dog, 
if you have, yes. if you've ever rescued a dog um, or yeah. a cat or any other animal, yeah. how do you, how do you establish trust with that animal? You're tracking, you're, you track yeah. the animal, you, you're, you're noticing how the animal is responding to you and you're acting accordingly. It's like the, it's a dance between your nervous systems, right? So you might, you might be very quiet, see how the dog or the cat responds to that. Yes. You might offer a little bit of food. And, and mm -hmm. again, you're, you're, you're going to get closer when, when it seems like the dog is showing through, through his or her body language that, it, it, you know, she or he feels safer. So it's, you're not, you're not like wooden and neutral you're being no, no, outcome no. independent neutral and you're allowing the, their nervous systems to relax into yours. So that's kind of what you're doing here with, with yes. somatic tracking and, and the way you're describing it, Sam, going to the shop and being terrified mm. and being able to, to allow the sensation is, is a, you know, is, is an ultimate show of safety and compassion yeah. for yourself as long as you're doing it, like you say from the way. so it's a bit like when a child's really scared at night going mm -hmm. look under the bed there's nothing look mm -hmm. nothing there we'll shine the light under nothing to see or just right. showing them the thing look da, 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 da. yes it's not something to be frightened of it was yes. just you yes. you've made a story around you've created a narrative mm -hmm. to try and match really what is a background alarm that's mm -hmm. been there from something that happened a long, long, long time ago for a lot of people in a very heightened state of nervous system arousal, of sympathetic arousal dominance. Mm -hmm. So they're always in this state of looking for the source of something. And it's never the thing you think it is. Right. So how did you then figure out how to work, what to work on regarding those things? So you, you said you have to know, you have to actually look for the source of the fire what is actually bothering me underneath and it may not be something that's happening right now in this moment in fact it no. often never is it often isn't rather so how how much work did you have to do to look back and find those things and resolve those things well because obviously i have a good understanding of psychology it was never difficult for me to realize what that was however it's one thing intellectually understanding it so this is this is sort of my beef a lot of times people can go to talking therapy endlessly mm -hmm. and understand the anatomy of how this thing went wrong so trauma is the perfect case in point however if you consider that our subconscious has run the show and i think can process something like 40 million bits of information every second as opposed to 20 bits of information of your conscious mind i think we can see it's a losing battle to try and really program it in that way what mm -hmm. you have to do is just ultimately experience and process by what you're doing neutrally observing it the stuff that's got stuck so just to give you the analogy if everything is energy and we should just be allowing things to come up and go away the energy of the body etc um somehow it got stuck it got repressed it got suppressed and we have to metabolize that and you can if you wish go right back and in a detailed way experience the trauma but at the same time allow yourself to feel what's going on in your body because that's all your brain wants to do but you don't even need to do that i don't think i think literally every time you feel that feeling whether it's going to the shop and feeling like you're about to be killed um you just stop for a second and just keep going into your body. Every time you make a comment, I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't want to feel it, whatever, blah, blah, just go, what am I not feeling? What am I not experiencing in my body? You don't even have to name the emotions. You can affect label, you can name the emotions saying I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling, but actually you don't even need to do that. If you just feel it, you people will have ex experienced this. You'll suddenly feel red hot or you'll feel freezing cold or you will feel this thing that's anger, but you won't even know it's anger because it's so primary, you haven't even labeled it yet. And then it will pass. If I may give a, 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 a an example of this, when I was really, really, really ill with the chronic fatigue syndrome, and this does, you know, it does tie in, it's the same thing. Couldn't get, I was on the sofa or bed, but um, prostrate. One of our cats died suddenly and my husband, Neil, had to take him to the vet and he didn't come back. And this is a cat I absolutely adored. Um, so suddenly, you know, I'm lying on the sofa, 
with all these sensations anyway and there's no cat now ordinarily if someone has experienced any sort of unpleasant feeling like grief or whatever you might go out to distract yourself you might have a drink you might be busy you might tidy a cupboard whatever there'll be some way of not having to experience some very intense primary emotions but I had no choice and I thought having begin you know I was beginning to be on the trail at this point no I'm just going to literally experience these in a visceral way and for a couple of hours I lay on the sofa and I experienced these this grief emotion just as an object and it was absolutely bizarre by I think the time my hubby came back from work that night I was completely over my cat's death mm -hmm. you just allowed that I the loved that cat as well yeah. I really I still loved him but I didn't have that thing because it went through and I realized I have a sister who still hasn't dealt with the death of our mother of, you know 35 years ago because every time that feeling comes up which is unpleasant she labels it as I don't like it and pushes it down does something busy da, 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 whatever and it's the same mechanism you just I think you know someone said you've got to feel it to heal it and it's one of those things but it's true mm -hmm. just feel that feeling it at times is vile that feeling <laughs> but every time you feel it you just turn down the volume a tiny weeny bit on it so do you think the, so they're doing that with the sensations but do you think people have to have an idea of what they're processing so like would they have to have some kind of inkling of what could have maybe caused their nervous system to go into this state so they know what to process i think it's helpful otherwise you're going to okay. just repeat the same situation again okay so so in your in in your by your advice, then it might be helpful for someone to do something like what I talk about in the free course or what Dr. Schubiner talks about in his book, where you, you have a look uh, at your life or Georgie Oldfield talks oh. about in her book. Oh yes. We have a look and you say, okay. okay, these are probably, these are probably affecting me, even if I think that they don't. And if I, if, if I'm, if I'm experiencing so strong sensations, then something there might have been triggered and That's it's sad. worth journaling or or just like you said spending time with the pure feeling i talk about that in the course as mm -hmm, well mm -hmm. allowing those those feelings to come to completion without trying to stop them because they yeah. they're unpleasant is is what you're saying is the key yes yes yeah okay i also think as well so absolutely yes i i think there's a place for deconstructing and understanding the anatomy of how the thing arose so talk mm -hmm. therapy is brilliant for that you know i'm a big Fan sure. of you, I really do understand, but then that's the limitation. Then you have to put it through the sausage machine and process it. Um, otherwise, it's going to keep presenting at one end. It's waiting for you to do something with it. It's like, yes, we understand it. We understand it now. Can we let it go through? Upon which note, I think it's valuable to talk about how one would do that if it's very, very strong. So, you know, pendulating, titrating that. So, with regards to people. I'm working with, if they've got very, very strong sensations which have been re repressed for sometimes decades, they are so overwhelming. Um, they are so repressed. It's like going on and talking about psychedelics. This is why we have to be careful with that to let it all out. If you don't have um, the capacity to actually deal with that and to archive it in a way and midwife it, if you like, in a way, it can be very, very dangerous. So it's like a bottle of fizzy drink. It's like that you're just going ch, 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 mm -hmm. and letting that out bit by bit. Sometimes if you let it off too much, it can overwhelm you. And then you your executive function goes offline. That's like saying you're 10. It's just like, ah, you know, you, mm -hmm. you can't really think. And neuroplasticity is difficult. So it's if you're doing the shop analogy, don't do a whole shop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, go in mm -hmm. and buy a can of baked beans and have someone outside waiting with you saying, you know, say, right, I'm going into the shop. You can be my safe thing to come back to. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come out and you might have to stroke my arm or do whatever. Um, and that's it. And then at that point, you come back to yourself, allow the feelings to surface, process them and then go home. Um, but do it bit by bit, you know, a, you a, a, do. A, a, in a gradiently mm -hmm. way. But I, the, as well with the journaling stuff, I think it can be useful. And I think I started doing that 
Um, but even that was too much because I couldn't really, I couldn't write and I couldn't see. So even looking at a page made me feel sick. But I do remember doing something with my father and just sort of stabbing the page. And I thought, oh, that's quite useful. I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> um, and the thing with people who become obsessed about journaling, and I, I feel there is a danger in this culture we live in now of it's being used to spiritually psychologically bypass a lot of time people you know get their nice little books and they journal and stuff and it, it's a bit like going to 50 minutes of therapy a week just going blah at someone and not doing anything for the rest of the week mm. it's not going to get you where you need to be so in terms of actually discovery and identifying what it is so, so helpful you can yes. experience those feelings that's very yes. good but it's not the journaling Yes. It's going to get you better. I think when we journal, it's a useful way of accessing memory. And so you're sort of speaking to yourself. So you are unearthing and dredging up stuff that needs mm -hmm. to be felt. But remember, it's the process as you're journaling, when you have a sensation that just wants to be felt, that's the thing. Because a really, really important, important point I want to make is that it's so exhausting often trying to heal yourself that you make yourself ill. Right. And people think, right, I've got to do my meditation, I've got to do my vestibular exercises, I've got to do this, I've got to journal, I've got to somatically track, I've got to do this. And at some point, I've got to, you know, eat. And that it, it's it, it's overwhelming. And I think for an already overwhelmed nervous system, it can feel so daunting. And it also focuses you all the time on what's wrong with you. What's wrong with you? Yes, You're, that's a good point. Yeah. So I want to pivot back, though, because I want to make sure I touch on this. People ask this question a lot. Um, so first of all, did you, did you use vestibular exercises at all? If I remember correctly, it was, I did. I, I used yours. Briefly. Yes. And I think it was good actually, because, because I was stuck on the sofa, um, and couldn't do anything. It allowed me to move my head. And because I felt it was something that was road tested by you and because I could have you and you were in there control. with me. Yeah. Uh, it felt like a way of doing ch that I, I could do that um, mm -hmm. and doing the spinning. I, I like doing the spinning because I felt so dizzy at the end of it. I just sort of surrendered to it. And I knew in a way that was allowing my brain to accept that sensation mm -hmm. in a way that didn't see it as a threat. Yes. Um, so I think at the beginning, it can be super helpful. And yeah. for you, yeah, for you, yeah. you were, I, I've spoken a lot lately about how all the times I don't recommend vestibular exercises, yeah. but in, it, it, it's just like you're saying, you were stuck at home, you were terrified to move, it, you needed mm -hmm. to have some control over over this, and it, it gave you that, it gave you a sense of safety. But then, yes. after that, you started getting out and about, mm. was the recovery linear? That's another people no. question people want to know. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course not. Yeah. And that's the, that's the spiral staircase. So, you know, in terms of neurology, you have to understand it's like when you have those, if the symptoms, if you've done a lot, your nervous system's going, oh my God, oh my God, what's happening? And it's going to send you, it's going to do that spontaneous recovery of an old maladaptive behavior, which in fact it's trying to help you because it's saying, this feels weird. You're not right. doing this. So if you go a bit fast, if you can hold your nerve, that's great. If you don't freak out in light of it, no problem. But you have to go at your own pace and know that just because you're going down doesn't mean you've gone back. Gone back. Yes, it's thank you. It's just you're experiencing yes. a resurgence. Your your nervous system is offering up an explanation, if you like, of, of what's going on. Because, of course, mm -hmm. it's constantly trying to read. You know, your brain is locked in here. It can't see what's going on. It's trying to experience raw sense data and make sense of them given previous experiences so another thing we should say which we really is come to the present constantly come to the present come to the present experience these things in the present you can't experience them in the past and you can't experience them in the future the only way you can make the future is in the present so if you come to the present and experience whatever sensation it is in an objective calm ish even though a part of you is going, oh my God, oh my God, this is horrendous. I feel like I'm going to die. If there's a part of you that can stay, no, even that feeling itself, even the feeling, I think I'm going to die and the comments coming up are the same as the dizziness. They're all part of the same thing. They're just 
a, a suggestion, if you like, mm -hmm. um, then you're okay. But you yes. have to do it in the present. And the second yeah. you start commenting on it and say, I don't like it, I want to fix it, it's just that like you've lost that present moment. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that's that's the where the magic is. So if you can just keep doing that, coming to the present and do the stuff anyway, if you need to, just stop, do a, a vestibular, uh, sorry, a, a, you know, a, a physiolog physiologic sigh, you know, physiologic whatever. Yeah. Um, very, very good. And mm -hmm. come to your body. That That's another really thing, thing that I found very helpful when you're having the sensations you're so in them feel other parts of your body feel the the complete physical self if you can your feet and your hands and all of you being filled and then you realize only a part of you is doing the sensations right that's another that's another good point i, I remember there was a time when we would we talked about this and the only place you felt safe was like a finger. There was like one finger that felt okay. And so day. we just, we just spent time there. I mean, we yeah. just always came yeah. back there. Yeah. So you, you've spoken about the sensations in past tense, but I want to make it very explicitly clear to people. Mm -hmm. um, do you have dizziness anymore? No, I don't have dizziness. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so people can recover. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, you have little moments when there's little flashes, like yesterday I was in the car and the windscreen wipers were going. I remember that was absolutely horrendous back in the day. Mm -hmm. The first time I got in the car and there was rain mm -hmm. on the windscreen and then the windscreen wipers went. It's like, oh my God, that was just like my head was falling off. It was so terrifying. And I got into the car yesterday and I had my, for a brief second, my brain offered that up it was for a nanosecond. It's just like, no, it's fine. Yeah. Um, it's it's funny because it obviously remembered this set of scenarios and just was 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 offering that. So um, no, but uh, yes, if you yeah. if I can do it, you can do it. But <laughs> the other thing is patience, patience. Hold your nerve. You are not these sensations. You are not the dizziness. And if you keep on doing it, even on a bad day, you are changing your 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 neurology to the point where this will become extinct. Um, you know, it took me sort of two years, I'd say, really. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. And that was working my ass off, and already having an understanding of this thing, and being very severe. So please just know that it is. Well, it's just it's in, it's actually inevitable. You will recover from it if you don't get in its in its way. Because, like you said earlier, people without trauma they have an acute situation, mm -hmm. and then they have an acute adaptation back. It's only for people like us who literally sort of put the brake on. We press pause, and so this thing becomes a loop. That's the thing. So. If we can just step back and allow it to be, it will just go. It has to. It won't mm -hmm. last forever. Nothing lasts forever. It really won't. It just seems like it. Right. And this this is why on my channel, I talk so much about some of these other factors. I've, I, I have said the same thing. I said, really, it's not a matter of how to heal yourself from dizziness. It's a matter of getting out of your brain's way. Because <laughs> yes. your, brain, your brain wants you to not be dizzy. It's very... Mm -hmm it's very energy consuming. It's, it's your brain very much wants to be not dizzy. We just need to get out of its way. And the stuff that gets at, gets into its way are many of the things we've talked about today, including all the, again, natural, normal responses, nothing that you're doing to yourself on purpose, but all these responses that we've had from previous times in our lives that were very adaptive and helped us survive back then, they show up now in response to the sensations, frustration, anger, anxiety, catastrophizing, obsessing, obsessing, compulsive behavior, compulsive Googling, like all this stuff. Again, mm -hmm. it, it, the roots of those things are in the past. Your brain is, has learned to run those programs, but those are the programs that ultimately are keeping the the neural circuit dizziness program running as well. And so once we we release you from those programs, your brain naturally will, will adjust. Cool. It'll recalibrate. Yes. You know, it's, it's pattern interrupt. If you come to the present moment, that pattern is interrupted and you put a new one in. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, and it will happen just by one more thing i did want to say that's really important yes. is um in terms of i mean you'll have been through this with your course but you have to really identify if there is anything genuinely your nervous system doesn't like in your environment and for a lot Good of point. people that might be yes. a bad relationship or something like that so there might literally be practical things you have to change which is tricky if you're stuck to the sofa or something but yes, yes. um that won't be the case for everyone but if your nervous system is working flawlessly and you're in an environment where you're not being i'm not saying you're necessarily with a, a dreadful violent husband or whatever but if you're being taken advantage of if your needs are not being met, if you're not able to express yourself because you're going to be rejected, if you're not able to show your vulnerability, if you have to be someone you're not because to be the true you is unacceptable, that is not something your nervous system is going to like. And it needs to learn the danger's gone. Mm -hmm. You're right. You need to make sure the danger has actually gone and that it's okay to be you, whoever you are you know, well, within limits, you know, anything that's going to make you feel, um, unsafe. feel unsafe is, is, is going to make actually, your nervous that, system react. That can be really irrational for some people because of yeah. their learning. it can be really irrational. So it might be a spider, I don't know, right. whatever. Right. And right. you know, you can, you can then in pro turn process those, but I think if it's something really, really obvious. So if you have a, a horrible neighbor or a, you know, a, 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 a something hanging over your head in terms of finances or family or whatever those do need to be resolved and that might actually have been the thing that created this anyway because it's saying to you you need to act on this this mm -hmm. is a, this is an orienting um primary process event mm -hmm. to alert you to a circumstance to a condition that needs attending to in some way right um, right and thank you for making that point because yeah. a, a lot of what we talk about is how you're interpreting situations is about the vast majority of the time. It's about how your nervous system is interpreting situations, but sometimes mm -hmm. situations are not good and yeah. you're, you're not going to be able to get around that. And it probably won't be the entirety of it because your, your stress yes. bucket will have already been full. Yes. And if you were feeling okay, you could deal with a very right. stressful situation, but it's just right. one less thing. So it's one thing you can do to help. And you did that very good video a, a, a long time ago about what, friends and family can do yes, to help yes, just yes, things yes. like you know just mm -hmm. touching you or you know uh giving you a foot massage or just asking if you're all right and not having to solve things for you yeah so any final words of i mean you just gave everyone a lot of advice but any any final words of wisdom to share with people who are going through this right now stay present always mm -hmm. and just experience know your nervous system is working flawlessly know that you are safe and there is nothing actually physically wrong with you at all it's just a maladaptation to probably a toxic in that moment environment your nervous system is overwhelmed and your nervous system and your embodied brain are the same one they had that we had 50,000 years ago and there's too much we're putting into it and that's all and your clever 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 brain is saying enough with the data's been used up, yeah. it, you know, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, pull back and prioritize. This is an amazing point which you can think what it is you actually want and who you are and where you want to go because otherwise we're just existing, which so many of us are. We're just getting to the end of a to-do list every day only to wake up and do it all over again. And because everyone else is doing it, we think it's normal. Normal does not mean natural. And um, there's a lot of very maladaptive behavior that just because everyone's doing it does not mean it's good. Mm -hmm. um, one only yeah. has to look at history to view that. So, you know. Yeah, oh, that's a whole can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we could probably talk for an hour just about that mm -hmm. last statement that you made. But but suffice it to say that I, the, the point that I'm taking away from that is um, just because it's the way you've always done things doesn't mean that it's working for you. And just because other people are doing things that way doesn't mean it's working for no. you either. No. 
whatever that thing is, whether it's pressure you're putting on yourself at work, pressure you're putting on yourself as a parent uh, or a caretaker or, or any other complicated life circumstance. And I think just know that it's always psycho-emotional. So when you have those sensations come up, just say to yourself, you're safe and it's fine. And just feel the emotion. It's amazing what you can do. I mean, just mm -hmm. doing some somatic things like a you know containment hug or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you can bring yourself back and do not repress any feeling in your body. So if you want to cry, cry. Um, if you want to sleep, sleep. If you want to do whatever, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about sleepy sleep. I'm not talking about um, sort of that numbing out thing. Um, I'm talking about genuinely starting to ask your body what is actually happening in the present moment. And quite often you'll start yawning, you'll start, um, you know, sometimes you'll cry. I didn't, I didn't cry for years. I just doing the whole of it. I couldn't even cry because I was in such a state of freeze. You know, I could not cry. I'd try and listen to sad music. I'd watch a film, look at an animal video. And it's like, it's such a relief because of course, all that cortisol will be processed and washed through when you do mm -hmm. that. So never repress any any physical symptoms in that way. It's all good. And well, we want to we want to clarify that doesn't mean that you're going to act on it, right? So no, no, if no. you're angry, no, it's no, not no, no, acting on no. anger, but it's feel allowing yourself to feel yes. angry in your body. That's what exactly. We're, that's what we're I mean, saying. I guess yeah. so. This this is something yeah. you know we talked about because I think I wanted to kill Neil at some point it's just acknowledging i wanted to kill neil without actually killing neil right. um and feeling, so your brain feeling. knows you've heard that um and it's like i've got this it's fine yes he is murder worthy but i'll deal with it in a different way i'll right. deal with a non-homicidal way right. um and just and just acknowledging that is that is the feeling but it's um it, it's it's so easy not to because we're so used to having to behave in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, but when you do the crying thing, this is another thing. When you cry, you start to then have the secondary thought, oh, I feel really sad. And you want to start explaining, no, no, no. Just the crying sad. itself is a sensation just like the dizziness. So I'll, I'll be watching myself crying, going, ah. you know, I, I, I'd quite often say, Neil, I'm just going to go and do some crying now. And I'll go, okay, it's, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's just it's just my body is ex, is wanting to do, you know, it's, it's trying to still slowly express decades of repressed anger and sadness. And it comes up at times, but I don't attach to it. You allow it. And that that's, again, I know we've, we've talked about that exhaustively today, but that mm. that's basically a, if we had to summarize everything that we talked about it's it's that it's yes. you really need to work to allow and again allow does not mean surrender and no, lie down it's nothing we just yeah. like you track it you experience it nucleus if you're watching television just watch it on tv over there your sensations your feelings your thoughts all of it none of it is you it's something you're doing it's something that's being offered up to you to explain what's going on normally in the past so come to the present moment allow it and it will it will pass allow it and, and ex accept it like lovingly I, again i have to add that because yep. it seems yes again yes. we're not we're not talking about uh detach like detachment or disconnection or uh um, no, no, dissociation no. it's not dissociation like you're over there and i'm over here like no no, 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 you, no. You're, you're coexisting you're, with it because yeah. if it's over there yes you're not you're not um exiling it Mm -hmm. You're not saying it's over there because I don't I, I don't want it. It's like it's, it's it's over there because I'm not it. It's just a behavior I'm doing, but it is part of it's part of me. I'm doing it. So it's like it's fine. Hello, you can be there. We can coexist. We can sit next to each other. It's it's nothing to be frightened of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Your friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. I've talked, talked a lot. Thank you. Well, I think you gave people a lot to chew on, but I think the most important takeaway here is if I've said this before and now I get to say it publicly, if Sam can recover, Anyone you can, can recover. Yeah. Kids, that's it. Take that home. Yeah. I yeah. can recover. You can recover. Yeah. With yeah. I, I've, I've said this. You are one of, you were one of the most severe cases I've ever seen. Yeah. And here we are. You're, and by the way, I, I'll probably put this in the intro too, but you're out there 
roller skating around London. Oh yes, and... my roller skating. Yes, so I, was, I and... ride bicycle. I went yeah. on a um, carousel the other day. Yes. So although actually, I did go one of those whirly gig things, and I didn't really throw up. That was pretty revolting. Well, but that I th oh. feel like we could allow that. Uh, that I think anyone <laughs> would do that. That I yeah. thought right, I'm going to do that. But I think yes, I'd have probably felt like that anyway. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. But yes, yeah. you 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 can do it. And of course, when even when I came off the whirly gig, I was just like, yeah, okay, I feel like throwing up in the nearest bin. I didn't. Um, but even that's just a sensation and it's harmless. It's not yeah. pleasant. And it didn't last and harmless. it didn't do anything didn't to you. Yeah. No, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's absolutely fine. Yes. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be You're okay. Gonna be okay, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. And so Folks, I hope you enjoyed this. Of course, please leave questions or comments below. Um, yes, and, and any questions, I'll look at it. If anyone wants to ask yes. me any more questions, I will look at the thing when you've done it. And if they'd like, if they yes. want some clarity, I'd be very happy to answer. Absolutely. See, so please be sure, again, especially if you have a question for Sam, you can leave it here and I'll leave it alone so Sam can answer it. Um, you're so desperate when you're like, you're so desperate. You just yeah. want someone to tell you what's going on. Right, right, hence right, right. Googling, hence the Googling, hence the Reddit, hence and, the yes, insane yes. scrolling yes. and yes. searching, you know. Yes, yes. It, yes, and Sam was there. Sam, Sam knows. Yeah. So, you don't need um, to go anywhere else than here to Yonit. That's thank it. you. Oh, thank you. Well, I try to make it useful. I mean, I, I, that's why I'm trying to cover as many possible sensations with as many possible success stories, because sometimes people mm -hmm. really, they need to hear there, there's something they need to hear. And when they hear it, they're like, okay, this is me. I can do this. But until they hear that one person describe that exact exactly. scenario, they, they don't believe it for themselves. So yes, yes, yes. So folks, if you found this helpful, please like the video, please share, please subscribe to my channel. That helps me reach more people. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can also follow or subscribe to the podcast. That helps. You can leave me a five-star review if you like it. Again, all these things, make sure I can put more content out there for people just like you who need to hear it. So thank you, everyone. And thank you. Big thank you to Sam. Thank you so much, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>